Now, I'm very excited on this edition of Isolation Interviews for my Facebook page and also Hospital Radio. My guest is the amazingly talented Sean Dooley. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, mate. Yeah, really good to join you on this uh, nearly rainy day. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, just before we came on air, I had to look out the window. And I thought, I'm glad I'm in here doing this today. <laughs> oh, yeah. a nice one. So, so I mean, how, how are you finding this whole situation? How are you coping with it all? It's... Um... <sighs> It's just weird, isn't it? I just have to keep remember, reminding myself not to swear. I'm a terrible swearer. So I keep going, don't swear, don't swear. <laughs> um, I, um, I just find the whole thing really, really bizarre. I've got four children. So me and my, uh, me and my wife, Polly, we are kind of homeschooling. We've got the eldest is 15. So he's suddenly <clears throat> not doing GCSEs and found out six weeks ago he's left school. So dealing with all that and kind of keeping him sane and, uh, and, and that. And then, and then the two littlest have just had their birthdays within a week. So yesterday was one of the littlest's birthdays. And we called them lockdown birthdays <laughs> and make them amazing. And we've, we pretended that we were a Byron restaurant yesterday in a spa. And then the week before for the littlest's birthday, we had, um, we put a tent in the back garden. We've got a normal sized back garden, generally in Victorian Terrace, but we put a tent in the back garden and pretended we had a mini festival. <laughs> so we put, we, we put up bunting and played music loud. Totally the neighbors were cool with it. But um, um, so yeah, it's just bizarre. I mean, I'm in, a, I'm in a really fortunate position at the moment that I can, I built a sound studio. That, um, uh, I, I got in quite early, bought the equipment I needed, was uh, luckily I had the funds to buy the equipment I needed, then built up a, an audio studio using sofas and mattresses and duvets. And, and I quite like things like that. Anyway, I'm a bit, I'm a bit kind of DIY, you know, dad. <laughs> and um, so, so luckily I'm able to still maintain some level of work doing voiceovers, which is just ridiculously blessed to be, to be honest with you. But I think the hardest thing, and I think it's probably for everybody, is, is, is the kind of mental health side of it, I think. Uh, trying to keep everybody buoyed and keep yourself buoyed. Because there's times, and I, I don't mind admitting, there's times where I just, you just drop into a well, don't you? And me and, me and Polly are really honest with each other. And at those times, we just go, listen, I'm, I, need, I need an hour on the PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you know, I'll I'll come out to the office and put the PlayStation on and just have an hour, and um, you know, she'll come out probably read a book for an hour or watch some television shit. So we kind of give each other breaks. But I just think it's real. I think what's sorry, I, you you asked and I'm talking. This is going to be a, <laughs> no, four, no, a four hour podcast. <laughs> um, I think I think it's I think the hardest thing is with us. I'm not getting political at all, but I think it's the not knowing. It's the ambiguity of actually what's going on. Um, it's the kind of feeling of, um, yeah, we'll come out of lockdown soon and the paper's going, we want lock out, out of lockdown now. So what it does to you, to your mental health is it makes you start going, oh, it's going to happen soon. It's going to be next week. It's going to be next week. And you keep saying that to yourself instead of somebody actually making a decision and going, this is happening. Kids, you ain't going back to school till September. That's, that's a decision. It's done. We're going to have to deal with that. Instead, my kids are going, are we back? Are we back? And we're going, so we've said to the kids, September, you're back in September, put that in your head. But I think the indecisiveness and not letting the general public know exactly what's happening is, it's not great for your mental health because you, you think it's just there and it's attainable. And also as well, you know, I think I heard somebody on the radio say it the other day, I think it was James O'Brien just go, that if, you know, if it's that close, then, you know, if it's going to be tomorrow, then well, let's go out today. Do you know and it gives you that feel in your head. So the other thing as well. Oh, mate, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I no, love it. Sorry. <laughs> so you're, just, you're just like, no, I'll just I'll leave it recording and just go get a cup of I think, I think what's, had, what's become difficult as well, and hopefully people who hear this or see this or whatever feel the same and it makes you feel better, is there's two things. One is that when you now go out, it feels weird. I feel, I feel guilt for leaving the house to go to the shops. I feel strange being around other people and it's almost creating a tiny bit of agoraphobia in in a, in a way and i'm not prone to anything like that i'm you know i can get down and stuff and you know all that kind of stuff but i'm not prone to being fearful of things really and i think that's happened 
um, on, on, on leaving the house. And yeah, but I mean, there's positives. There's, there are some positives. Do you know what I mean, I think everybody's now a lot more mindful of uh, like the hour a day. I think now people are going, right, I need to do some exercise. I need to do something. And also as well, I'm hoping that working from home, you know, the skies are clearer. The, the, it's not just in our heads. The, the, the air seems cleaner. And I'm hoping that after this, there's a lot of big companies that go, do you know what? You don't have to do the three hour commute through London, which is where I am, to get into town every single day, cramped up with everybody, to sit in a miserable office with no view and do the same job you could be doing at home. And I'm hoping that that starts to, our way of life starts to just shift slightly. And I think the longer this goes on, it probably will, um, which I think is only a good thing for people who can stay at home, go to a room in their house and, and work and you know, have a tea break with their own kettle. Like you say, I mean, there are positives and negatives. I mean, obviously, the downside is we're not seeing family. We're not able to have yeah. that close connection. Although I do feel that people are talking more and people are agree, doing yeah. Skype, Zoom, all those things, FaceTime. Yeah. So do you think it is bringing people closer together? I think it's a weird thing. Isn't it? my, my best mate lives in Newcastle and I only ever see him when he comes down for auditions. And then we go, right, can we make it work? And I've got family. He's got a family. So it's like... And often auditions quite often a day before or whatever. And it's always last minute. We never make it work. And we suddenly went, right, let's do this. <laughs> like with granddads, let's do this Zoom thing. <laughs> and, and you get on it and, you, and we, had, we cracked up a couple, couple of beers. And we, had, we had two hours chatting. His kids came and said hello. My kids came and said hello. And just sat there having a couple of beers, chatting. And we were both like, why have we not done this before? Why have we, you live so far away. Why have we not just set up the computer, cracked open a beer and had a chat? You know, and it's... Yeah, it's not, it's not perfect because, you know, I'm looking at the camera now because <laughs> I know you're filming it and, and, you know, I look at you and you, you can't see into my eyes and it's always, it's that connection thing. But I think it has brought people closer together from, from distance. And also, you know, this uh, technology, which I absolutely love, it's just given us freedom to be able to, to connect, really. And I'd like to think that hopefully when this whole situation is over, that we will kind of take it with us if that makes sense that we won't yeah. forget about this and just go back to normal and everyone kind of loses contact with people hopefully this will bring us closer together and we'll stay together as, as, a, yeah. as a nation yeah and like your gaming headphones which prior to people <laughs> were like oh he's a gamer look at his gaming <laughs> headphones are gonna go through the roof <laughs> my top tip buy shares in gaming headphones <laughs> <laughs> now I mean, obviously, you know, we're all having to do things to keep ourselves, you know, sane. I mean, obviously, you know, homeschooling, we've got people that are having to, uh, to, you know, just, I mean, I'm doing this to kind of keep myself occupied. I mean, obviously, you're so used to kind of doing things that, you know, you're acting, your voiceovers, and you say you've still been able to do some of that. But obviously, things like acting, I mean, presumably, you have no idea when that's going to go back to normal, when you're going to be able to get onto a, a film set or a TV set. Yeah, no, I had, I had three jobs lined up prior to this that were all going to kind of go do, 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 on the back of each other one of them which I was really really look a really great part and and I, uh, yeah so and basically yeah it's all just stood down and I don't know until when and interestingly I was thinking about this the other day you know one of the the big things I've I'm signed up to do hopefully they still want me in two months time for the same part but um um yeah it's set in a particular uh period is set in spring do you know what I mean so that if we come to film that eight weeks later we're going to be filming that in autumn or winter and whether or not that script's going to change or whether or not they'll go no 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 this is a spring piece and spring's important to it so therefore that rolls on to next year and it's really it's 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 difficult but I think there's a I think with anybody kind of I think do you know what I was going to say creative and that's just that's just rubbish I think with everybody we, we, there's an undue pressure on all of us, I think, to create, to do something, to learn this. In the first, when we, we took our kids out a week before uh, the government lockdown, because we'd had enough and we just went, this is crazy. And we were chatting to friends who had friends in Singapore and around the world. And we just went, that's it. We're pulling, we're, we're pulling out now. We, we, we're not doing it anymore. And um, I remember I sat down with the kids the first week and I said, Let's, on the lockdown, when it actually officially happened, I said, right, what do you want to do? Give me one thing you want to do. And it was kind of like, learn to play guitar, learn Spanish, learn, you know, just master Minecraft. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, and, you know, I think there's that, I berate myself pretty much every day that I 
haven't finished the novel I've been reading, not even writing, reading for six months, which is brilliant, but I'm a really slow reader, <laughs> that I've not finished that, that I haven't finished uh, this film script idea that I'm on, working on at the minute, that I haven't written a novel I want to write, that I haven't recorded another song, that I've not... And I think... And then you get on social media and you see things doing stuff, and then, again, that makes you feel, I've got to do something, you know what I mean? And it's, I, I think we we're unduly putting this weight on ourselves that we have to come out of this with some extra skill that we didn't have prior to it, which I think is a bit unfair on ourselves, but I guess it's, that's very human, isn't it? But, um, so yeah, I don't know if I did answer your question, but I'm trying to stay creative. I'm playing, I'm playing guitar, but I still can't get onto the F chord. <laughs> I'm still on every, every chord, but the F. So, uh, I'm not getting further with my guitar than, than I was before, but, um, um, yeah, definitely um, just trying to be imaginative and with the kids and turn, you know, turn the kitchen suddenly into a takeout. I mean, you know, do crazy golf in the house, you know, those kind of things. We kept all the tin cans and then we did beer pong without the beer the other day and, you know, that kind of thing, really. So It's one of those things that, I mean, although there's so much time, at the same time, there isn't all that much time because, yeah, I mean, totally. I found that days are just totally. going like that. Yeah, completely. There, there's such a lack of time, isn't there? And and the days just go really quickly. It's 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 really strange how me and my, me and Polly say this all the time. We go, there's just no time in the day, and maybe when when it all goes back and then the kids end up back at school as well, maybe we'll realise we actually did have time in the first <laughs> place, but we just weren't utilising the time when we had it. Maybe I don't know, but it is really full on. Yeah, from getting up to going to bed, it's pretty um, it's rammed, isn't it? Mm. And yet there's no work. <laughs> and I was also, no, I saw on your Twitter that you've even been having funny dreams as well with Reese Witherspoon, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I think every, I've, been, I've been seeing on, twi on Twitter and stuff, everybody's been having r really weird dreams. Um, uh, yeah, I've had some bizarre dreams. I was in a haunted house last night. Yeah, um, it's re really weird. Yeah, me and Reese, we were just sat uh, having a chat about life and stuff on massive beanbags. And I woke up and went, are we friends? Are we friends? Should I text them? <laughs> yeah, really, yeah, really bizarre. I mean, I say it's, it's one of these things that I think our minds are just so confused and so kind of weirded <laughs> yeah. out, but they're just playing tricks yeah. on us. I mean, yeah. ne next I'll be talking to Tom Hanks in my sleep, I reckon. That'd be the next <laughs> one. But even that, did you see that leaked footage of the uh, UFO or something? Mm. Even that, normally, I would, be, I would be straight on that. I would be looking at it. I'd be studying it. It came up on my timeline. I went, don't care. <laughs> Massive asteroid heading towards Earth. Not bothered. Nah. It's, you know, think... I'm like, nah. <laughs> Gonna watch somebody do a TikTok dance instead. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the thing. We're all finding other things to, to keep ourselves occupied. Uh, yeah. Now, I wanted to talk very, um, or a little bit about your um, album that you did for Children in Need, which yeah. I bought a copy of, and it is fantastic. Oh, oh, so, I mean, you, what was the process like of getting that together? Because that seemed like a lot of work. It was it was a ridiculous amount of work. It was it was a project that has been going. I did a series called Misfits years and years and years ago, and I got to sing um, in that, and I sang and I it petrified me, and I loved it at the same time. And I came, I remember coming out coming out the um, it was a, uh, um, a dialogue booth where I recorded. I remember coming out and I said to Polly, I went, we should look at doing a charity single and get our friends because if I love it, I think. Do you know, I think within everybody, there's an inner rock star. I think we all want to be pop stars. We all want to smash it on a guitar and sing. You know what I mean? And um, so we, we started letting it kind of ruminate. And then, um, and then we both went, let's really try and do it. And I know Jodie Whittaker from years and years and years back, but I was doing Doctor Who with her. And I said to Polly, I said, listen, why don't I test it out on Jodie when I see if Jodie, and if Jodie says no, uh, let's just sack it off because you know I mean because she's kind of up for stuff so you know she'd be interested and I and so I was on a break in I think in South Africa were we and I said um, I said listen I had this idea um, recording a song your song of choice it has to be something that means something to you that you care about record it any way you want this is all about you record it in Fresh Studio and we'll release it for charity and um, she went yes I even know what song I'd sing. <laughs> What? She went, I do yellow by Coldplay straight away. Honestly, that was the first thing she said. And I went, oh, are, are you sure? She went, absolutely. <laughs> so then from then, I, I then phoned Olivia uh, Coleman and I said, uh, right, I've got Jodie. Uh, she said, yes, this is the idea. And she went, oh my God, yes, 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 yes. 
So then I just kept, I just phoned people in my phone book, which is quite a cool phone book. I know, <laughs> myself, but, um, and just phoned the only, only, only one I didn't know was Helena Bonham Carter. So she came from a, a real moment. Um, uh, oh, no, so that was, oh, that was, that was Phoebe, who I do know. Sorry, that mixing up stories. Um, Helena came because um, uh, one of the producers knew her and just went, I'm going to bring her in for, um, uh, would you like to have her in as part of the group? And me and Polly were like, absolutely. She's amazing. So we, um, yeah, we got her in. But it was, it was, it was, it was such a brilliant project. We were talking about it the, the other day saying that imagine if it had been this year, it would have just all gone completely to pot and children in need is 40 this year. So this was supposed to be a huge celebration for them. And I don't know what's going to happen to that, to that, that night. Cause there's kids still out there who need the money and, you know, charities still out there that need the money. So I don't know what's going to happen, but yeah, it was brilliant. And to have, that as an end product to have that cd and to know one, one of the things i sold to the people who are coming on on board to do it is i said that for forever this will earn money for children in need and nobody earns off this album one of the things when we went into the bbc we sat down and we said nobody gets paid nobody gets any money from this the only people that earn from this are obviously you have to pay the people who make the cd and you have to pay you know the costs of actually forming a cd but like none of the musicians none of the producers um get paid and then what's brilliant is that for forever every time it's streamed i know it's only a small amount of money but every stream every download every time the album's bought for forever goes straight to children in need which is a great legacy to leave behind you know what i mean oh. say it was it, i mean you were so lucky with the people that you got on it because it just it, i mean you know the amazing names the amazing voices as well i mean for, yeah. i know i know uh, watching the documentary um just watching um jody whitaker performing in front of her family it was yeah. just so emotional and I was yeah. nearly in tears as well. I mean, it's just yeah, it so, really, you must've been so proud of it. Just absolutely sort of happy yeah. with the success of it. Really proud of it. One of the things I mean, we, we never asked anybody if they could sing. We, we never said, can, can you sing? Because we felt it was more about, it was more, I, I used to make mixtapes a lot as a kid. And, and so it was basically just a huge mixtape for, 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 for me. And, uh, me and Polly, we, we we didn't ask if they could sing, and we didn't interfere with their song choice. So we didn't. We never tried to mould something together that is a really nice playlist that runs through. We just basically said, "Your choice." We didn't want songs from the musicals. That was the only stipulation. We said, "No musical um, songs." And the reason for that, if anybody is interested or whatever, <laughs> is is mainly because I think for me, um, members of the public expect actors to suddenly start belting out Les Mis or, you know, Miss Saigon or something. So, and I, and I wanted to pull away from that and for people to pick songs that meant something to them that connected, you know, the birth of their kids, what they got first dancers, you know, parents, favorite songs, whatever. But they had to be something that meant something to, to them. And I think that's, I think that comes across in the, performances because i think everybody's invested in the song prior to singing it and i mean the other amazing thing with the album is obviously a few of you got to uh, meet the people who originally sung the song so obviously a couple of the members oh, of yes. coldplay came along and you got to meet taylor swift were you expecting that at all i still don't think it happened <laughs> <laughs> i still think she's she's with reese in a dream somewhere um uh, I was not expecting any anything like that at all. If I had, I would have worn a better shirt <laughs> and maybe, maybe some nice aftershave. Um, I, I, it was t a total shock. It was really weird because the night before, because we don't let our kids be on telly or anything like that, and the night before, um, Polly's getting the kids, getting clothes, because they were going to come and watch me record. Sorry, itchy nose. Um, because, we, uh, because my song was for my kids, and it's something I sing to the kids. Then she said, let them come and be off camera, but watch you record at, at Abbey Road. And you know, so it was like, yeah, absolutely. Got experience, you know, going there. And my boy had already been, oh no, no. My boy went later again, again and managed to play on Paul McCartney and John Lennon's pianos. And wow. Stuff. <laughs> oh, met, what an amazing thing. I went into studio two, which is the Beatles studio. And, um, and just sang, I think I sang yesterday and they're on my own and just went, <laughs> I'm singing in the same place. Um, but we, um, 
we uh what was i saying oh yeah yeah, yeah. so so yeah my uh, polly got the um she was getting the kids all dressed up and i was going why are you making such an effort for the kids they're not on camera nobody's going to see them why and she was like going i just want them to look really nice. <laughs> she's knowing that taylor swift is potentially coming because even the night before it was kind of like will she you know, will she be able to make it work so i'm like this is a bit strange and then during the day i went last because obviously we were producing it um and during the day we were running around getting her, making sure everybody else is all right and she kept disappearing polly i didn't know that she had three or four members of security of taylor's security turn up sweep abbey road looking for everything exits all this thing and she's walking around with these four burly guys <laughs> I didn't know where she was. And at one point I was following her going, let's just go have a coffee. Let's, let's go have a little calm down. She's like, no, no, you go have a coffee. I can find you. <laughs> Hour later, I'm like, where are you? Um, and she's running around the studios with these security guards setting everything up. Um, so yeah, and then when it actually happened, I was, I'd sang it, it's slightly different from the documentary. I'd sang, I'd done two recordings of it, I think. And she turned up in the middle of the second one, apparently, and she was hidden in a cupboard uh, in Abbey Road, a, a small kind of cupboardy, cubby hole kind of thing. And then she came out as I started singing, and she just stood there, and uh, I swore really badly, so which was edited out of the documentary, I really badly swore. <laughs> um, I couldn't... I couldn't I, 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 looking back and watching it, I kind of wish I'd been cooler. I, I wish I'd either been cooler or more shocked that I'd like passed out <laughs> or something. Like that. I do, uh, you know, but um, yeah, so she came in and she was honestly a genuinely, genuinely lovely human being. And she looked up, she saw the kids in the balcony, which you couldn't see on camera, and she waved to them and went, I'm just going to talk to your dad and then I'll come up and see you, which was lovely. And then spent some time there. And then what happened was, uh, we went back into the recording studio. Olivia was there. Phoebe Waller-Bridge had stayed behind because she knew what was happening as well. Phoebe's sister, Isabel, uh, Isabella. Um, and um, we were all, uh, they were all in there. And then they just said, said uh, Taylor said, would you sing it for me? I haven't heard it yet. And I was like, no. <laughs> of course I will. I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to ruin your song in front of you. <laughs> and then, um, so Olivia went, come on, come on, sing it, sing it, sing it. So then I went, I kind of had a moment where I thought, if I can sing this song, because I'm petrified of singing, in front of Taylor Swift, her song, then surely next time I go into a read through, uh, to table read, I, I'll have more confidence. <laughs> um, and I went back and I sang it, I sang it for her in, in the booth. Oh. It must yeah, have... It's amazing. It was, as, it, as I say, watching it, uh, you know, on the telly, it, it looked like you were... Absolutely, you know, didn't didn't see it coming, and I was even surprised that Olivia Coleman had her number in the first place. I was like, you know, I mean, you, you forget that she's become such a huge star. You just still sort of imagine her as sort of a peep show days or something, and <laughs> yeah. made all these contacts. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, what the, the other thing is, was she as good? Was she as nice in real life as you thought she was going to be? She was. I'd not seen um, her documentary Americana, so I didn't have an insight into it. I just knew her as a recording artist mainly because my girls had played it to me and then kind of really enjoyed the music <laughs> a lot. And um, she was better. She, she did this thing, which I've heard kind of mega, mega, mega famous people can do, which is make you feel like you're really important or really special. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So she made me feel amazing. Do you know what I mean? She made it, she walked into the room and it wasn't really about her. It was about me. And then, when the kids came down, it was all about the kids. I mean, and you know, they messed about, you know, the cameras were off and she signed, yeah, no, no, she signed, but she took selfies with them and things like this. And it was all, it was always from her. It was about the other person. And to be, to be really honest with you, look, this is, this is a British charity. It's not American. She's not like she's somebody who you could look at and go, oh, it's just a celeb trying to get a bit of publicity. She doesn't need the publicity of, coming in and surprising this bloke from Barnsley singing a song with a colliery band. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so she, you know, she turned up at her own expense, got herself there, got, you know, security. I mean, she came with an entourage, do you know what I mean? Of people to protect her and came in, did it, spent, you know, was meant to give us 10 minutes, spent well over an hour with us all um, and gave us a, a blessing and then, and then left again. Do you know what I mean? All at her own expense at her own valuable time of which she has very little. So I will, I will never be able to thank her enough. And what she did 
for raising the profile of that program and of our product is is huge you can't put a price on taylor swift suddenly you know putting a tweet out saying watch children in need tonight oh watch sorry the got it covered documentary which is still on the iplayer <laughs> you can still watch and you can still download the songs and raise money for children in need but oh, done the other thing i was going to say is do you think you would ever do another one in the future another album yeah we are uh, we were to- uh, the thing is it took so long i mean honestly matthew it took we were so it came out last year we were on it the year before and we pulled it because we didn't have enough time to make sure we got the right caliber of people and it was good enough so we pulled it from two children needs before uh, because rather than rush it we wanted it to be a really high-end product and then we started again on january last year so it took a whole year almost um even with everybody with in january last year we even had everybody on board who was going to do it so that just, just took nine months, 10 months of just getting it to, to documentary stage. Um, mainly because of people's schedules, because they, you know, they, have, they have very small windows and they all have families. And so when they go, I've got a day here, you, you know, you've got to jump. So we were then talking about doing it for next year and the difficult second album thing of thinking, you know, what do we do? How do we <laughs> up it? How do we change it? Because I'm not interested in staying the same at all or churning out something similar but maybe not as good or whatever i want i want it to be different so we've got some ideas we're working on stuff and talking to people and, and what's nice is now i bump into famous people who go oh uh you didn't ask <laughs> oh, can i do the album go, well are you free next year so yeah i would like to do it again and unfortunately it has scratched a bit of a a niche for me because now i'm now i think i can i can sing and record <laughs> i don't really but when I'm doing, often when I'm doing the um, setup for my narration and things, I'll often get my guitar out and then start singing <laughs> and, and record it uh, and record it and play it back and go, is that okay? Can I do like that? <laughs> I've not quite got the guts to do something, but it was funny at the time, yeah, there was a talk of, you know, do I do a full album with a colliery band on my own and all this? <laughs> and it's crazy. I sang live a few times, sang live on uh, Radio 1 and... Um, sorry, Radio 2, sorry, sorry, Zoe. Uh, <laughs> live on uh, Radio 2 and, you know, sang live at some uh, big venues and stuff. And Yeah, it was amazing, but I'm under no uh, illusion that I'm suddenly a, a, a pop star, although I kind of wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> have you got sort of like a, a guest that you would, just a dream guest, someone who you'd love to have on the, al- on the next album? Um, or is that still, you know, you just, maybe Reese Witherspoon? Yes, maybe I should ask her. <laughs> I don't know, really. It's it's a funny one. I'd quite like to open it up slightly to a few Americans, only because then we can bring in a huge market from over there to sell. It's it's all for me. It's all about selling um, selling <laughs> albums. Do you know what I mean? To, to, to raise as much money as we can. I think we've raised nearly a million, um, which is incredible. Which you know, who ever thinks they're going to be able to do that? So that's amazing for us. But yeah, I, I might have to think about who would be my It'd probably be somebody huge, wouldn't it? It'd probably be, you know, some kind of crazy big hit. <laughs> My wife would say Brad Pitt. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should do the whole of the, the whole friends of uh, the cast of friends. Yes. That'd that. be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now, very briefly, let's just have a quick chat. Cause obviously, you know, if anyone is bored, like we were saying, there is so much they can, they can catch up on, including the Netflix series, The Stranger, which I yes. love. Well, what was oh, it yeah, like working it. on that project? It is, I mean, a great cast. You obviously had uh, Richard Armitage, Jennifer Saunders. I mean, that I know, amazing. She's brilliant. She's really brilliant. I was sat between both of them for the read through, and I was so nervous because I just was going, "Oh my god, you're there, you're there." I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> um, it was it was brilliant. Uh, Richard will say the same. It's one of it's one of our favourite jobs. <laughs> Not that we're, you know, he's sat he's sat here. Um, um, it, the whole cast and crew, everybody was just, everybody kind of wanted to make a really, really good show, and and also as well wanted to have fun while doing it. So it was, it was a proper bit of a family, really. It was, I, you know, I kind of wish, you know, we had the opportunity again, but it was, it was brilliant. I never ever, I never thought it would be as big as it was. I mean, you, you never do because you, you're in the middle of it, so you can't quite see it. But I was shocked at how. I mean, you know, people, I was heading to France before lockdown and it, I'd been driving since I left at three o'clock in the morning from France to drive everybody home. 
I left at three o'clock in the morning. I do a straight drive, about a nine hour drive. And it was about six in the morning and I pulled up to get some diesel and, uh, and, and I'm just leaving. And this British family pulled up in front of us and they were going, ah. <laughs> and I was like, I was like bugs in my hair a mess. Like I've been driving for five hours. I went, hey. and they went, can we take a photo? And I went, no. <laughs> <laughs> then the cameras at the at the thing i was like wow but it was um yeah it's become um it's been a really big hit and you know everybody there's been a few delivery drivers who we've done um selfies from a distance which has been fun but i think what's been brilliant about it is each episode the hook on each episode has been great i mean even as i don't watch things i'm in normally and even us we kind of went oh i really want to watch the next one so i think it's been brilliant to pulling people back in and also as well it's 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 really intriguing there's lots of lots of different storylines and and i love that about it harlan colburn's writing is brilliant and danny brocklehurst who uh, also you know wrote it as well i mean when it first came to you did you ever imagine how big it would become how popular no. and pe- how much people would love it no not at all i just loved it and then i read the book um and loved that and then said yes to the job and uh, no i didn't it's funny but then I guess when you first read um, the first Broadchurch scripts, maybe uh, I didn't read them, so I don't know, but I'm, I'm guessing you, you just you just never know. I've done some things where, where I've gone, this is going to be great, and then it's not been great. <laughs> <laughs> and I've gone, wow, I read this, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> or even um, things you go up for and you, then you don't get. You know, I've been up for series and gone, this is going to be one of the best things, uh, series ever, even if I, you know, I'm not to do with it. And then it tanks, do you know what I mean? Or vice versa, you read it and go, nah, this is rubbish. It's <laughs> the biggest, biggest thing in the world. Now, I'd just like to say it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much uh, for taking time to, to talk to us. Um, before we go, though, is there any messages you'd like to give to anyone who's watching or anyone listening in hospital? Um, no, anybody listening in hospital, um, especially if you have this or even if you don't and if you're isolated from family and people can't visit you, I guess really just hang in there it's we are going to get through this we are going to come out the other end it's probably going to be longer than we think but you know put the end date further away and then if we released it earlier then it's going to be it's going to feel better but get better look after yourselves and keep safe thank you so much sean it's been a pleasure keep safe and thanks again cheers matthew thanks mate